Do these nerdy superstars get after it anymore, or do they just tuck themselves in and <laughs> game all night? It's a good question. It's a good question. Hey, we got Frank Saravalli. Frank is like, Hi. Your phone blowing up? So, uh, yes. Uh, sources, I don't know, is his mic on? <laughs> sources say the players did get after it last night. <laughs> See? Yeah. <laughs> good. See? Good, good. Did Frank some, uh, so get after some it. phones were being taped up at the entrance to a party or two. Nice. So. No Fo photos. No photos. Phones being taped up. That's awesome. Old school. I like that. It'd be nice to get out there for those guys and just know that they're not on camera 24-7. Like, you talk about them. You know, some people are poo-pooing. But come on. Who cares, really? It depends what you're doing. Well, yeah. If you're blowing lines off of a mirror, <laughs> then I think that's a totally different thing. And, and you yeah. know what? No one wants to see that photograph. But if you're having a casual cocktail... A hundred percent. What's but wrong with that? You also know the media these days. TMZ would jump on it if uh, you know McKinnon's dating this guy, and some girl comes up to take a picture with him, and his arms a little too close around her. Oh, now his girlfriend's calling him that. It's like, can you just get the fucking cameras off of me? Can I just have a time out here? It'd be nice for them to go to a place where the cameras are taped up, and they don't even have to worry about it. And then maybe they do blow a little. I guess. Things. Well, <laughs> so yeah, that was a night. I like you it. You see Buble last night. Mushrooms? It was on TMZ. Zoomies? Hey, thanks to Matt Larkin. I'm not yeah, sure that, exactly. that I'm not sure that, that gets out there if not for our, our intrepid daily face off sure. reporter Matt Larkin on the scene <laughs> asking questions of Buble. <laughs> um so big like question it. for you. Uh, what the fuck are we doing on March eighth? Good question. Uh <laughs> let's see how long the Calgary Flames hold on to Chris Tanev and or Noah Hannafin, and mm -hmm. then I'll be able to better answer that. But yeah. I mean Look, um, a GM said this to me last week, and I think I said it on your show. If you take the f if you took the three guys from the Flames out of the top five, what are we looking at here? <laughs> it's thin. It, it does. It get well. You know what it does? I think it forces teams that are in contender mode to get smart, try and pursue other players. We've heard just in the last twenty four hours names that really haven't been out there because they're not the traditional. Uh, you know, pending UFA rental type players. Hey, let's go look at Scott Lawton from the Flyers. Let's mm. go look at uh, Boone Jenner from the Blue Jackets. Pick a guy that has a little bit of term that is valuable to his team that they feel like, hey, you know what? If I'm going to be giving up all this stuff, I might as well get a guy that I have under contract for the next few years. Yeah. Does that ever happen where, you know, guys go kind of against the grain and call a GM and say, we're looking at this guy and the GM's like, he wasn't even on my mind. Like, and then you start exploring other avenues or is it kind of depends like, if the offer is legitimate yeah. like if they if it you, you don't just kind of mosey into a conversation and say i i kind of like this guy or like uh mm -hmm. you know maybe what do you think about like just say no hey i'm really interested in x and i'd be willing to pay a lot and here's what i'm thinking then all of a sudden it kind of gets the wheels turning a little bit hmm. what do you think the average amount of conversations are between making a deal is it ever just a one-shot deal or it depends is it on the humming two. and hawing kicking tires Two depends managers involved. <laughs> it depends how stubborn they are. Well, not even that. It's just some guys are able to – like I know there was a trade last year that took, I think, two phone calls total. Really? And mm. was done in an hour. Love it. And it was basically like, hey, I remember you called me a few years ago about this guy. I've told this story before. It was Philip Ronick. And the Canucks and Jim Rutherford had, had made an inquiry previously, and Steve Eiserman called and said, this is how it was relayed to me. Hey, uh, I remember that you asked me about Philip Ronick, and he said, well, if that's the case, are you still interested? And, and apparently Jim Rutherford obviously said yes. And he said, okay, here's what I'm looking for, X, Y, and Z. And if that's okay, I won't shop him around. Call me back and we'll do the deal. Jim said, give me 30 minutes. He met with his staff. Boom, done. Trade happened. Easy. It's like my wife in Mexico not bartering <laughs> with any of the people there. Just like, how much does that cost? Okay, nice and easy. Where I'm like, hold on a second here, fella. What are we going to do about this? And why don't you throw that in and doing a little wheeling and dealing, baby? Sounds like those two guys are straight to the point. I love it. I love it. And and Jim Rutherford, um, he's involved in everything. Like, he probably single-handedly keeps you employed, right? <laughs> not single-handedly. I mean, there are 31 others, but yes. It's pretty active, though. Because, so I'm trying to transfer this over to like the Brad Tree Living conversation. Uh, you know what they always say about him? He's active and he knows about everything. Is that true? Like he's in everything? He, he's generally very aware, I would say. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What, are you, what, what are you hearing on their front? Because obviously we've had this conversation the last couple of weeks. Like they're in a weird, precarious position and it's like they don't know if they should go for it. Just stand pat. What are you hearing on their front? Well, I think that's what they're sitting back and thinking 
also examining the past few deadlines of, hey, we gave up a lot the last few years for some rentals that really haven't panned out. And then you start to look at your prospect cupboard and you say, well, if I'm going to be here for the next however many years, five years, eight years, Brad True Living was in Calgary for a while, I, I need to have a certain number of assets available to me. I, I don't have very much cap space, but a little bit now, thanks to John Klingberg. The defense is obviously really thin, and we've talked about that for a long time. You know, you, you look at that situation, you say, well, is this the year to load up? I think it's a fair question and a proper existential question to ask. But my response to that would be, are you really going to let a 70 goal season from Austin Matthews slip away? Are you really going to pay all these guys this much money to just sit tight? And maybe that's the play. Cause I've argued before that, you know what? Sometimes it's the small move. It's the curated selection, the guy for a second round pick that ultimately ends up making the biggest difference. Go through mm-hmm. the last number of Stanley cup winners it's not always trading a first rounder that True. gets you there. And so if you believe in your team, which I guess basically the sense we're getting is that maybe they don't <laughs> and fair, fair questions to ask. It's just that I have a hard time doing that with this core. It is tough. The situation they're in with these four guys got to make hay while the sun shines yet. How do we accomplish that cap implications? What's out there for defense? Say, say a deal gets done tomorrow for Tanev we got to shore up our blue line at the deadline who, who then who's next in line like uh like uh, the names aren't aren't world beaters that you could get your hands on and how much it, is too much what do you give up for him to be fair is tanev a world beater no, no he's not no and and I, I just view tanev as more in the same line of go through some of the other pe- and i know it's a different regime but whether it's giordano or muzzin or brody or like you you're getting guys that are in their mid 30s that are just on the wrong end of the the slope. Yeah. Like they're they're going down, mm-hmm. and that's a tough thing age chart wise to really. You know, you're not asking for forever. You're only asking for a few months. But considering the price that you pay, it might be pretty significant. Do you think anyone on the current roster could be involved? And who do you think that could be? Who could be thrown in? Maybe someone that would surprise people. That hey, you're gonna throw this guy in. Someone might need him. Or is it kind of the way it looks? Well, I think that's the other tough part about this is then, okay, so you pluck off a piece here, then you're trying to, you know, fill that spot. And Mm. then, like, you go, you what you do is you end up going about creating more holes that way, Mm -hmm. unless you have an authentic hockey trade, which, like, I hate the term because all trades are hockey trades. But unless you have an old school, hey, we think this guy's a better fit than what we have. I, I just don't see that materializing for the Leafs right now. So two teams that I think sort of make sense, Philadelphia, you mentioned Scott Law, and he went to my high school actually in Oakville. Um, I know so, lots of so, good. So Philadelphia, a good dude. Columbus as well. Like, are, are those ideal sort of trade partners that the Leafs are looking? There are some defensemen. I know they've been looking at Walker, Sealer, guys like that. Are are they ideal? Like, what would they? Would that makes? Is that where we should be looking from a lease perspective? Because I, I think you're so right. Like, who who's out there? You know, I think you start looking under mattresses, <laughs> in between couch cushions. I think you that that'll get it done, eh? We just talked about this market and how it's not great, and how there's a bunch of players available, but there's probably a pretty good reason why most of them are right. All of the really good players are locked up for term. Yeah. And there's rare exceptions. Lindholm's a really good one. But those go for an arm and a leg comparatively to probably what the Leafs have a stomach to spend right now. And that's that's sort of their the world they're they're living in. Do you notice a trend of the deals getting done before the deadline? Like I remember the trade deadline I think last year was a little thin, too. You're looking around going, well, geez, look what they've already done. You're obviously centered around shows like that. Are you noticing a trend where people are pulling the trigger early and earlier and not waiting? I think this is pretty standard. I mean, yeah. Yeah. over All-Star, I would say that part is a bit of a surprise. It typically doesn't happen. But you're also giving managers you know, a five-day bye week in between where, True. hey, well, I don't have to be at the rink. I, I don't have to be watching a game. I don't have to be traveling. I've got some time to sit with my staff in an office, make calls, and make things happen. So nice. that part has – but it, it's probably pretty typical between December, January, and February. You know, we're now two days into February. You're usually looking at a small handful of deals, three or four. So it's somewhat standard. We're uh, we're seeing the dominoes fall. So you mentioned Lindholm goes to Vancouver. Sean Monaghan, like an hour ago, goes to Winnipeg. Um, Adam Henrique, my boy. What, what, what 
is he the next domino to fall? Like the New York Rangers would make sense. Like where do you think he's headed? Oh, I would think that the Lindholm deal snapped everyone to attention, basically saying, hey, if you're in the market for a yeah. center, you're now down to two uh, impact options. And now that Monaghan's gone, hmm. and when you considered, I think, the list of teams that you know probably would have been in the mix, you're, you're, you're now – the the pool has been narrowed, right? Because two teams are out, but you're, it's, it's the last guy left unless you're dealing with someone with term. And maybe that's – as yeah. we just said, maybe that's the play. Creativity, right? All right, let's leave it at that. Uh, we know what's coming up on DFO Live. Todd McClellan, oh. Sean Monahan, a lot of the same stuff we just talked about from a league-wide perspective. And we'll have on uh, Matt Larkin, Great. Who, who made things happen with <laughs> uh, with Michael Buble <laughs> last night breaker. and Stephen Ellis. So we got lots to tackle. And, and by the way, some other big league news coming today with oh. the uh, 2025 Four Nations tournament as well as... 2026 and 2030 Olympic hockey announcement. Was that Friday. spoiled, by the way, by the IIHF? Did they put out a tweet and then deleted it, I saw? I think that's happened before. Yeah. Is it out there now, though? It, yeah, I mean... Because Batman's talking today, right? Yeah, that was... But once once they sent out a thing saying yeah, that you're done. Gary you're Bettman and Marty Walsh are talking together, I mean, a pretty good you know, indication of what's coming. Nobody owns news, Who Nick. owns the Chiefs? Who owns the <laughs> That's news? That's pretty good. Well, Frank, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm thankful you, you came on after my display in Alberta, and I, I thought you disowned me as a team member. So I, I would never do that. No. I'm a true team player, and I got a little excited in the third game. Dude, you're awesome. <laughs> like well, like next year, Frankie's getting brought. fucking C. That's what he's getting. Make sure to check out more of our content right here on the Leafs Nation YouTube page. We got long form interviews, we got clips, we got epic rants by Jay Rozo. We simply have it all. And don't forget, you can find out much more at theleafsnation.com. Thanks so much for watching.